Five Republican candidates for U.S. Senate have made the cut by filing the required number of signatures. The August 7th primary will soon be here. To help us handicap the race is a former candidate in the field, Rick Wilson. We'll discuss on West Michigan Week. And thank you for joining us on West Michigan Week on the panel, Flying Solo, Doug Copeman, Professor of Political Science at Calvin College. Right. Thanks for showing up. You're welcome, Patrick. And Rick Wilson. And thank you very much for inviting me here, and I do appreciate the opportunity extremely. We, we exchanged emails this week because yes. it, was, it was an yes, interesting we situation we found ourselves in. You, you had scheduled right. to be here as Correct. a candidate. Correct. Fell short on the signature. Correct. But we decided, you know what? Maybe a little insight. Well, might you be asked me. I said yes. You said fine. And here we go. You made the drive. Absolutely. Well, tell us about this experience and, and signatures and, and, and having enough signatures filed. What happened? Um, well, a, a, you know, I, I caught basically walking pneumonia over the winter, and that really knocked me out of the campaign for mm -hmm. about three months. Uh, so it's 100% my fault. You know, I didn't plan ahead of time, far enough ahead of time, you know, to acquire the signatures like I ran for Congress to get them to have them and have them out of the way, early, over, done with, you know, forget about it. Now. Running for the United States Senate is a quantum step up from running for Congress. And when I ran for Congress, that was a quantum step up than running for registered deeds in Genesee County. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely, you know, and getting the 1,000 good ones, 2,000 to submit for Congress was something that I was able to do myself, my opponent bought them. Um, my Republican opponent, you know, who knows what the Democrats did. You know, and running for the United States Senate, getting 15,000 mm -hmm. good signatures, and that's a challenge. There are five that are filed. Who Man. knows whether the fifth person who only filed 15,000 will actually make it onto the ballot. Does he have enough good ones? So that's mm -hmm. another challenge there. So that's why you submit the 25,000 or, you know, if that's, I forget. Right. I'd have to, that to be I'd verified. Have to and you know, you know, and it's a statistical sampling that the, uh, you know, secretary does. And, you know, and if there's a problem, they go right. in and, Go give it to it. You, know? you, you don't and have to we'll go, go in depth that. here, but but it's interesting when we talk about buying signatures. Yeah. Uh, just for the casual viewer of the show who who may not be familiar with this, mm -hmm. you could potentially buy signatures. Abs How does that work? A absolutely. Well, you know, not being MoveOn.org or any of those organizations, we actually have to pay for them and have them verified. Um, but literally, there are consultants around the state, you know, in every county. Mm -hmm you know, that you can hire, that will hire a crew of people to go out there and at the, you know, depending upon the caliber, the quality, the assurance that you want, and everything else, 50 cents to a buck a piece, signatures acquire the signatures. So if you're, it's a buck a piece and you're getting 25,000, there's 25,000 bucks right off the top. And that's not per, that you're per se buying the signatures, but you're not going out there and having the voter interaction yourself. And I right. found when I was running for Congress that that voter interaction over just the signature part of it, you know, is even better than the normal door-to-door -door campaigning in many respects. Mm -hmm. And most people are willing to give you a fair shot to sign to let you, you know, be on the ballot. You know, much more so that I don't want to talk to you, slam the door in your face, right. you know, when you're a real on-the-ballot candidate. So, you know, I think it's one of the best campaigning tools that there oh. is. So you like it because some states, and there's been a discussion usually sometimes by people who don't quite make ballot access, that it would be better to pay a fee or have a smaller signature quota that to qualify, and that if you just paid a few thousand dollars, you'd be on the ballot. You don't share that view? You think really the petition, the uh, 15,000 valid signatures well, uh, and a, 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 it is, is a good a idea. Cur current law, I think yeah. it is a good idea. You're required right. to get 100 from over half of the right. congressional districts, you know, so you can't just get all of them right in your hometown from all your hometown supporters, right. as if my Republican Party in Genesee County would support me. Um, so, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I think it's a fantastic idea in some respects. You know, I would right. say you have to get more from around the state, maybe some from every county, maybe right. some from every congressional district. You know, because just to let every Tom, Dick, and Harry onto the ballot like they do in Europe, 
you know, with 3,000 different political parties, I think is foolish and mm -hmm. stupid. I think our two-party system works pretty good, and there should be a high enough bar that really serious people, oh, bad me, uh, get on right, the ballot. Right, right, right. The Republican primary up till now, the, all through the winter and in mm -hmm. the early spring, seemed to be nominated by uh, forums, usually by local Tea Party, mm -hmm. self-proclaimed leaders mm -hmm. of Tea Parties, mm -hmm. real leaders of Tea Parties mm -hmm. all throughout the state. Um, was that true? Was that sort of, is that really what happened, that the dominance was the Tea Party group? And what did you think about that? Was, did that help you, hurt you? Um, other than the fact that I missed most of them, right. unfortunately. Right. unfortunately. Right. You know, and I made several too, obviously. Yeah. Um, I think it's an excellent thing to do. Now, we could debate, you know, like in the presidential campaign, you know, there were debate after debate after debate, and that's all there was was debates. But at the same time, you get a pretty good look at a person in some respects a lot better than you get from, you know, a, a 30-second, you know, commercial or, right. you know, just a blurb on the news or anything of that sort. And one of the things they have to be able to handle is, you know, the public. You know, they've got to be able to present themselves under a pressure. How can you negotiate with Iran if you can't handle a debate, you know, how can you negotiate with, you know, the Ayatollahs that make Adolf Hitler look like a nice guy, you know, repeating 1938 and appeasement mm -hmm. if you don't know what you're talking about and you can't handle a debate. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's at the president, you know, and then at the senatorial level, you know, on a relative basis, the same kind of things apply because certainly not that it's the prime minister's questions times in parliament, which I think are really a lot of fun. But, you know, within Congress, within right. the Senate, while they're all being nice and polite and nobody's playing the part of Joe McCarthy, you know, they still cross swords a fair amount, and then you get out and get interviewed by the press and do some more. Or you can be Dick Cheney and say, mm -hmm. you know, to uh, mm -hmm. a senator and stuff like that. So you've got to be able to handle the heat in the kitchen. It's a good way to do things. And certainly the involvement of the Tea Party folks is fantastic. That's tremendous. Mm -hmm. One of the best things that ever happened was to get the silent majority grassroots out into the public, mm -hmm. you know, out there and involved and committed, you know, rather than just sitting back on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. I know in, in Ottawa County, Jim Chiodo and the uh, Ottawa County Patriots, mm -hmm. uh, they've had a number of forums, they've mm -hmm. had debates as well. Um, and then as things moved along, I know a, a lot of the candidates traveled the state to a number of these, uh, I guess, town hall meeting mm -hmm. type situations and did have some debates. Mm -hmm. And then a couple months ago, MI4CS, 4CS, Michigan 4 Conservative Senate, had what was a convention in the Midland area, correct? Mm -hmm. Did you like that idea that uh, different tea parties would bring delegates to a convention and then, in essence, coalesce behind one? Well, uh, you know, there's a real question. And the question comes back from right. um, the governor that we currently have and that race. You know, you know, Rick Snyder ran as this kind of candidate. And he didn't participate in anything else with anybody else. Mm -hmm. And the fact that his social views are, according to the social conservatives, far too moderate, mm -hmm. not on his viewpoint at all. They're just not on the table to him. You know, that's just somewhere else. Right. You know, in effect, a libertarian style of viewpoint almost. Right. Right. You know, in effect. And there were social conservatives, and there are a lot of social conservatives in the Tea Party, even though formally that's not their venue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that said, we don't want a repeat of that. We don't want right. another, you know, social moderate you know, even though Rick is a pretty good, not as good as I'd like, but pretty good fiscal moderate, you know, mm -hmm. you know, uh, on the ballot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's I, a I, part I, of why they did right. the way they did in trying to figure out and coalesce around, uh, is there a can, can, some candidates that we should just reject? I guess I guess I, asked, not. I guess I asked that it, it's a timing issue. My question is, why not wait to find out mm -hmm. who has the signatures, who's there, and then open this box up and, and find out then have the delegates. Well, for, for, for uh, you know, again, there, there, there are some groups, you know, that like to vet candidates before, right. you know, so that their particular candidate, the one that they like the most, you know, will get the support, you know, to get on the ballot to win the primary, mm -hmm. you know, before the general election. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's a way to do it. I, yeah. I think I think that's fine. I think that's right. I, I you know like you know I committed to Pete Huxter in the governor's race long before the filing date. Okay. Simply because looking at all the candidates, there was no one else that even ought to be in the race, in my opinion, which we'll talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Well, I was going to ask you, that's where you were heading. Is uh, <laughs> there anyone, uh, in, either in those Tea Party Four or anywhere else, who sort of surprised you as doing particularly well or particularly poorly? I know several of the candidates kind of have a claim to the Tea Party movement. Gary Glenn is making a strong yep, claim. Yep, yep, Pete but Hoekstra, on the other hand, was founder of the Tea Party caucus in the Congress when right. he was in the House. Yeah. How do you, from that, among the five who are on the ballot, who do you really think is uh, perhaps both most popular, maybe most genuine around the issues of steep fiscal conservatism and some social conservatism, which is what the Tea Party would. Well, from, exactly. from that aspect, yeah. and not to say, like I will later, that those two need to be equally balanced with some other things, mm -hmm. okay. okay? But uh, in that respect, you know, uh, Gary Glenn does have a little bit of a leg up, okay. absolutely. As far as the social conservative end up being part of the American Family uh, Organization, mm -hmm. okay. you know, uh, such like that, you know, he is you know, very much the favorite in that respect, you know. Uh, you know, Pete is less so. Right. Uh, I think the other three ought to just all resign and step out of the race and let Gary and Pete have at it. Huh. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, next weekend, <laughs> there is a, next weekend the Detroit Economic Club is having their annual up in Mackinac. Mm -hmm. It's been, been a little bit of a controversy. They've invited only two Republicans. They've invited Hoekstra mm -hmm. and Clark Durant. Oh, bad decision. They've not invited Gary Glenn, and they've not bad invited decision. Andy Heckman, and they mm. not, have not invited Konechki, I believe, is the last. Pete Konechki. Pete Konechki. Mm -hmm. uh, good or bad? Already I know it's bad, but why is it well, bad? Well, you know, and, 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 and again, you know, the Detroit Economic Club, every one of us in the race was a fiscal conservative. Right. Every single one of us. The differences between us were, as far as what we were advocating, were quite small. Mm -hmm. Now, because Pete Huckster has a record, then Gary Glenn could go after Pete's record. And there's some things in Pete's path. Pete admitted in 2008, here in Grand Rapids, at a John McCain opening event, okay, town hall. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the first questioner, if you ever want to watch that tape. <laughs> okay. Um, that, that he said that he was part of the problem in Washington for the spending and the debt, mm -hmm. i.e., under Bush, he just wilted. That's a problem for Pete to handle, and Gary dishes it out just fine. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. The question is, has Pete really learned anything? Has he really reformed? You know, and uh, I honestly don't know. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, maybe an answer from Rick Wilson <laughs> in just one minute. back with Rick Wilson, former candidate for U.S. Senate. All right, so let's, let's hop back on this discussion on Mackinac Island and, and who's well, invited and who's not. I think the Detroit Economic Club has done, the Republican Party has done, you know, our republic here in Michigan a great disservice. Hmm. You know, all five candidates that made it, you know, in the ballot, now if one of them gets knocked out, then four, you know, but the ones that made it should all be there. They should have an equal opportunity to voice their opinion. And then if the Detroit Economic Club wants to, in their own smoke-free back rooms, <laughs> make a decision and say, we're for that guy, they can do that. But right at the moment, I don't think they really know or understand enough about him. You know, and to disallow Gary Glenn, you know, Pete Kenechi, um, Heckman, you know, it's just, it's bad politics, mm -hmm. it's bad business. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, that, that would, be, you know, go is ahead. Is it driven only by their fundraising numbers? Because Durant and Hoekstra had, seem to have a lot of money and the rest well, is the other yeah, three, not so okay. much. Is that fair? Well, that you, know, fair? The, the, you know, the, the Republican Party seems to have this dream that values, beliefs, and ideals are immaterial. It's how much money have you raised. Mm -hmm. Pure and simple. The RNC has said that to me. Mm -hmm. And I think they're a bunch of lame ducks. I think they're just, you know, the RNC really needs to have an enema. You know, there's no doubt about that whatsoever. Right, and, and you can look back to, uh, you know, early on in, in the presidential race here. You know, Rick Santorum, uh, just here in Kent County, I was at his event, mm -hmm. and you could see that there just were not high-ranking Kent County Republican officials in that room. It mm -hmm. seemed as though... But at, but at one time, he was charging forward, and he looked like he might actually be able right. to become the leading candidate for a while. But this is where the party says, we're going to back this guy now. Well, you know, okay. You know, well, the Republican Party can do that, right. and they should be open to, you know, whatever level of criticism, you know, there can be. Mm -hmm. I joined the Republican Party, you know, uh, before I retired, mm -hmm. you know, before that, you know, just on the sidelines, but to reform it from within mm -hmm. rather than just throw rocks at it from the outside. So why did you run this time? Why are you planning to to run again, it's obviously not because you have a lot of money and you just are looking to spend it on things, but there's something more. Is it yeah. the vision and the values? Yeah, and, what and, are and, and, here, and here's what, what, are I, yeah, here's what I want to get across. Yes, yeah. you know, I worked 35 years on salary at General Motors in Delphi in business as a manager, engineering, engineering manager. I have a bachelor's and a master's in business. I understand business real well. Question, would you allow a candidate that didn't know anything about economics or didn't know anything about business to speak of to run for public office and have anybody do anything other than just laugh at. Uh, you want to go over the, the numbers in Congress? Well, because there are, there are, there's a high number of those. Right. Well, you know, again, there's a disagreement <laughs> about how much they do or don't know. <laughs> but here's the point, okay? Right. We're, we're, we're facing many different critical things in this, this country, you know, and there are Tom Coburn's talking about, you know, we're going to, crash and burn, you know, from the economic standpoint. And certainly if you look at what's happening in Europe and if we're not learning any from that, there ought to be some lessons there somewhere, mm -hmm. okay, that we ought to work with. And being a Delphi Salary retiree and, and being under Obamacare, I understand how unbelievably expensive it is. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, the, the reform that needs to be done there, what we need to do with our health care, again, is a central right. part of this campaign. But I will submit to you, you know, besides the social values that mm -hmm. Gary Glenn brings more than anybody else, because we are watching the social fabric of this nation being dissolved. Mm -hmm. You know, we are morphing into something completely different from what we have been. And an open question is the destruction of the family, is, uh, you know, destruction of you know, our becoming a nanny care society, becoming a dependent care society, what does that do to the right. fabric of our society, you know, ourselves? But I will submit to you, and here's where I'm different from any, uh, any other candidate, mm -hmm. that we face on the national defense foreign policy arena threats that are equal to or greater than anything we face here domestically. And that's also what I bring. So would you have just a, you know, one trick pony running like we've got five of them now going for it? You know, or do mm -hmm. you want somebody that can actually juggle more than one ball at once? Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm running. So the, what I've got here is, mm -hmm. you know, if you talk to Representative Trent Franks on the House Anti-Terrorism Caucus, Republican Arizona, Newt Gingrich is another good guy. Mm -hmm. The threat of Iran with a nuclear weapon is not that they'll blow up one of our cities with an ICBM. Mm -hmm. That's plenty bad enough but they'll run an electromagnetic pulse attack against us. Mm -hmm. No electrical system for three or four years. The estimates are that nine out of 10 of us will die from thirst, starvation, mm -hmm. lack of medical care, you know, la lack of everything. You know, the whole society fabric goes back to the horse and buggy era and 90% of us don't live on farms. Mm -hmm. And we're in deep, deep trouble. Iran has practiced shooting a missile off of a barge off its coast, straight up 30 miles. Mm -hmm. And there's only one reason to do that. You get three of those, one off of each coast, the Gulf Coast, east, west, mm -hmm. three of them, you got 30 seconds from launch to kaboom, electromagnetic pulse that'll cover the whole US of A, and we are toast as a country. Gone. Mm -hmm. The largest genocide in human history. 
But yet, here we are doing nothing. I agree with Ambassador Bolton. We're doing nothing to keep Iran from getting nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And I know you've heard about yeah. you've heard of this, right? You were yeah, I've Washington. heard it. I remember right. studying this a long right. time ago when I right. worked in Washington. So I'm just, what's yeah. the legitimacy so, so, of this? So, so what's to be done about this? I mean, well, other people th know this than that, you. That's why I, I right. published this book. There's okay. a lot of defensive things we need to do because okay. we need to worry about North Korea. We need to be concerned about the instability, mm -hmm. you know, that may be forthcoming in China, the instability that may be forthcoming in Russia. And of course, if Iran gets nuclear weapons, you know, then that spreads them around the rest of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia paid for Pakistan's nuclear program. So all they got to do is that. And Saudi Arabia will have nuclear weapons. Then we've got a Sunni Shia. Who knows what will happen after that mm -hmm. in the hands of who? You know, which Hezbollah, Hamas? You know, Jamaat al fuqwa whatever group will who give what to, where, how. You know, let's not even start down that path. Okay. Yeah, give yourself a plug. You wrote this. I, I <laughs> put it you put it out there. I, I put it together. together. Who wrote this I, book? I, 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 <laughs> edited, I okay. edited this. Yeah, this yeah, is my documentation from my studying. Uh, okay. Okay. And I teach classes to tea parties about this and the effects of that. Okay. Now, a minor thing over that you know, is if the sun does it to us. Now, we don't know if this will happen this year, next year, or a thousand years from now. We just don't know. Mm -hmm. But if we have a big one, like hit us in 1859, hit us again, okay, a big, you know, chronal mass ejection, okay. okay, and we've got four satellites up there that are working on this, so there's some good work that's being done. We've got a space weather center that warns us, but they can't tell whether it's a civilization killer headed our way or not, mm -hmm. okay? So we've got to have a lot better cooperation of industry and in shutting things down because that's the only way to protect ourselves at the moment. But again, no electric, every transformer in the whole northern hemisphere blown and shot, no electricity mm -hmm. for 10 years. That's not a world I want my children to live in. Mm -hmm. That's not a world I want to live in. So I also have that and it's this like an book info is in there. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. myself into here. All right. Yeah, now <laughs> the other thing, the other <laughs> thing, you know, so, so there's two, you know, you know, one natural, this one is very closely associated with this one as far as what we do defensively and how we harden our facilities and such like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they, they kind of go hand in hand. You know, the other thing is slow. This part of your debate, do you debate people on this stuff? I, I do, <laughs> and I'm the only candidate that openly speaks about all these subjects uh -huh. at every event. And all the rest of the folks go, oh, let's talk about what's important, the economy. This is important too. The economy is not going to kill 280 million people in one year, right. mm -hmm. okay? The other one is the demographics of Islam. England, almost certainly. Austria, almost certainly. Russia, most likely, will be overrun by Islam, demographically, before the end of this century. Now think of having Pakistan West, mm -hmm. where England is today, with all of their nuclear delivery systems, their subs, their missiles, their airplanes, their production, their facilities, all of that, and maybe they'll be our good friends, and maybe they won't. But that's part of what we need to do to protect ourselves against this. Here in Michigan, our own Muslims here in Michigan want us to become an Islamist country. You know, Dearbornistan is what we call it, and for darn good reasons. Nobody there wants to notice that. We've got so many people, almost the entire Democratic Party here in Michigan is snuggled up to care, the Council of American Islamic Relations. Half the Republican Party has done the same darn thing starting in the governor's office. You know, that is heinous. How can you snuggle up to a front group for Hamas and say that's a good thing for us to do? But it, it, are all Muslims bad? I mean, no, uh, well, no, that's what I'm no, trying to figure out here. Not. I mean, it but, makes it sound like, but, you know. But, but, you know, so we can parse the number of uh, peaceful Muslims. And the majority of people don't want to blow, blow us up or cut our heads off by any stretch of the imagination. But will they oppose the folks running for office that will want to impose Sharia law? And that's where the dividing point is, mm -hmm. really, you know, for us in this country. You know, and Michigan is headed towards becoming the first state later this century that will have a Muslim majority to put into office maybe real nice guys that will be really good to the rest of us and maybe not. Now, how do you make that projection, just the growth of the Muslim population? Pro nothing ever happens to change that in the next hundred years? Is well, you know, and again, you know, works? the Muslim population growth around the world sure. is slowing down from what everybody right. thought it was back mm -hmm. um, six, seven years ago, okay? Absolutely, that is, that, that is happening. Mm -hmm. 
you know, whether indeed that slowing down will cease or not is an open question, and it's not slowing down here in the U.S., the Pew, fo the Pew folks, okay? You know, George Soros supporting wonderful Pew folks, mm -hmm. thank you, you know, are forecasting that our Muslim population is going to triple before 2030, mm -hmm. okay? That's going to give us about a 20% Muslim population here in Michigan that's going to change the politics mm -hmm. of this state dramatically. 20% is not 50%. 20% is not 50, but why would it so stop? There are a lot of reasons why it would stop. I mean, right. the, the worst thing you can say as a social scientist is present, you know, current trends will always continue. They really oh, oh ab absolutely right. Yeah. And, you know, there, there certainly is going to be there. But I also, you know, have put together 4,500 pages of documentation to substantiate my view that we're in deep trouble. Yeah. I teach classes about it. And when all the other candidates are here, put a big pile of sand over there. Tell them to put their heads in that mm -hmm. pile of sand and talk to you out of that pile of sand because... Neville Chamberlain and Winston Churchill were members of the same political party, and I'm the only Winston Churchill-type candidate in this race or any race. All right. Well, in 2014, and last and thing, I've gotta, Obama go. is Obama's a go here. Okay? <laughs> Not because I so, but because the rules of Islam say so. I am out of time. 2014, you're taking on Carl Levin. Doug Copeman, professor of political science at <laughs> Calvin College. Thank, thank, you, thank you for being here. Rick Wilson, thank you, sir, for making the drive. absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. And thank you for joining us this week. We'll see you next week on West Michigan Week.